Good morning to you on this Sunday morning. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The Word of God I have for you today is from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before you in the precious name of Jesus, your Son and our Lord, and we thank you on this day, Lord, that we have this opportunity to open your word. As we do so, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, anoint me to preach your word, Lord, and anoint those who listen. May this word bring forth fruit in each of our lives. We thank you for your word, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. My beloved friends, uh, many years ago I saw a sign on a church building that simply said, Faith is a verb. This little sign was so thought-provoking, and it stayed with me all these years. And I often think about it. Faith is a verb. I would like to delve into this a little bit today. And as we do so, I have two main points. Firstly, the faith is an active work. And secondly, the faith produces works. So firstly, faith is an active work. The letter to the Hebrews defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Having an assurance requires an act of faith. We actively place ourselves in God's hands and we seek his face in order to have the conviction that our text speaks of. So faith clearly is a verb. Faith is a doing word. Faith is an action. Faith is not simply sitting back and putting your hands in your lap and saying, well, okay, sarah, sarah, whatever will be, will be. No. Faith is not fatalistic. Faith is not fatalism. Faith is an active pursuit of God and his will for our lives. J.B. Phillips translates the verse this way. Now, faith means putting our full confidence in the things we hope for. It means being certain of things we cannot see. Faith is putting our full confidence in God. Faith is the foundation of our relationship with God and the basis of all of our hope. Faith requires us to do something. Namely, to place our trust in Almighty God and His Holy Word. I love the way Paul encourages us and tells us in Romans chapter 12, in the first two verses. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I love the way that this text says it is, it is our spiritual service of worship. Service is a doing word. Service is action. Service is something that we do, we serve. Serving God is an ongoing process. Serving God is a conscious decision that we make. And to serve God today, in 2021, is to swim against the common tide. Most of the people that we meet every day most of the people around us, out in the community, don't serve God. 
They serve themselves. The majority of people out there are seeking and doing their own will, not God's will. So we're swimming against the tide if we're serving God. And I don't know if you've ever tried to swim against the tide. It's not that easy. To swim against the tide, you need to put in a lot of effort. And you have to keep swimming all the time. You've got to keep moving. You've got to keep moving your arms and kicking your legs. Because as soon as you stop swimming, you get dragged along with the tide. The flow drags you along. You have to keep on swimming all of the time. And that's why over and over in God's word we come, against, come across these verbs and these commands. We're commanded to stand. We're commanded to be awake, to be on guard, to be active, to be doing. The tides of the times are extremely strong. And if we're not actively building up our faith, and if we're not actively working on our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ constantly, we'll get pulled away into error very, very quickly. Paul here is urging us to offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. And this is something we need to do not only once in our life. It's an ongoing thing. We need to be constantly submitting and resubmitting ourselves to God's will. In the morning when we wake up, it should be one of the first things that we do. And maybe many times throughout the day we have to remind ourselves, Lord, I, I'm just giving myself to you, I'm submitting to you, your will be done. When we go to bed at night, that same thing. We need to act in faith to give ourselves to God and to place every situation, every moment, into his hands. In the name of Jesus. And I found that the more that we do this actively and consciously, the easier it becomes and the greater our desire to do so because it becomes natural to us. And we begin to understand and we begin to see that God's ways are always the best way and that God does all things well. And we experience the blessings that come from obedience to his will. We read in the book of Jeremiah, and these are very strong and powerful words, so please listen carefully. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see prosperity when it comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitants. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green. And it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I don't know how familiar you are with God's word, but if you are familiar with the Psalms, this sounds very much like Psalm 1, where David contrasts the righteous, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And he says the righteous man is like the tree planted by the waters that bears fruit in its season. Leaves do not wither and everything he does prospers. And then the wicked, the way of the wicked is like chaff which the wind blows away. You see, blessings come the way of the one who lives for the Lord, who trusts in him and obeys him. Blessings come to the one who lives and obeys God's word, to the one who places his hope in God. The last verse of this passage that I read 
tells us something very important about the condition of the human heart. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. That's our problem. Because of the fall, because of Adam, our heart is deceitful. And so easily it abandons God. So easily rebels against him and seeks its own desires and its own pleasures. Paul understood this. He understood the battle that we face every single day. He wrote that the good that he wanted to do, that he desired to do, and that he knew he should do, he didn't do. And the evil that he hated, he, that's what he found himself doing. And then he pointed out that the only solution to this problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, the good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I hate, that I do. And then he says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's your answer. Only Jesus can save us. Only Jesus can set us free here and in eternity. And that is why we must actively pursue him and place our trust in him on a daily, hourly, minute by minute, second by second basis. So then, faith is a verb. It's work and progress. The second point is that faith produces works. Faith that does not produce works, good works, is dead. It's a dead faith. James probably spells it out the best of all of them. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. James rightly teaches us that faith and works are indivisible. They go together. Here again we see faith in action. Faith is not a passive thing. It is not right to say, I believe in God and then do nothing about it. Produce no fruit, no evidence whatsoever. If somebody says they're a Christian but there's no evidence, you have to wonder if they really are a Christian or not. I love a little sign I've got in my office. It says, if you were accused of being a Christian, would the evidence be there to prove it? Think about it. So many people profess faith in God, yet they fold their hands in their laps, they sit on their blessed assurance, and they do absolutely nothing and wait till God calls them home to heaven. That's neither pleasing to God and it's no good to anybody. Jesus said that the branch that doesn't bear any fruit gets cut off the vine and thrown into the fire that is good for nothing. God expects us to bear fruit for his kingdom. Please realize that if you are a Christian, you are an ambassador. You are God's representative here on earth. We are his agents here on earth. And our role, Jesus said, is to be salt and to be light. Our role is to be witnesses to the truth. If we were simply saved and for an eternity in heaven, which is what our reward will be, but if we are just destined, that's it, then the moment we are saved, God should take us out of this life. He'll take us the moment we're saved, the moment we believe in Jesus, bang, we're dead and off we go. But that's not what happens. He leaves us here for a season. And while we are here, God wants us to bear fruit. We have work to do. We must be about our Father's business until He calls us home. Jesus said, You did not choose me, 
but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. Ah, here we go, my friends. This is where the the theological rubber hits the ecclesiastical road, as one of my professors used to say. Jesus said that we are to bear fruit. Our faith needs to manifest itself in, in our works. There must be fruit. And the main fruit is love. Jesus said, love one another. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. You see, love is the sign that we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are his children. And love is a verb. Love is not passive, love is active. Love is a manifestation of our faith. Love and faith go hand in hand. So faith needs to manifest itself in works of love. And I would put before you that 2021, which has just begun, gives us so many opportunities in a very practical way to manifest our faith and to manifest our love in very simple ways. With this pandemic raging around us, one of the great acts of love that we can show is to wear a face mask. Not to grumble and complain, say, oh, it's uncomfortable. Wear it. It's an act of love. It's an act of faith. You see, you're not only protecting yourself, you're protecting others. And that's an act of love. You're not just thinking, oh, it's uncomfortable, I won't wear it. You are protecting other people. It's a very visible and powerful way of showing that you love and doing all the other things that we need to do, like washing our hands, maintaining our social distance and finding opportunities every day to do the loving and the right thing. Love is an active thing. It's not hard. It's not hard if we abide in Jesus. Really, we can only love and we can only do good works if we abide in Jesus. Jesus made this very clear. He said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. You see... When we not only entrust all to Jesus, but when we actively pursue faith and abide in him, then our lives will bear fruits of love and God will be honoured and people will be blessed. May God help us not only to be hearers, but to be doers. So my friends, go forth. Love. Let your light shine before men. Let your salt be salty. And may all men know that we are his disciples by the love that we have one for another. May the words of our mouth, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to him. And may the works that we do, the lives that we live, bring glory and honour to him. God bless you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, how powerful and wonderful is your word. Thank you for your word. 
I pray, Lord, that you would take these simple words and that you would just sink them deep into all of our hearts and that we would go away from this message inspired with a new desire to serve you, to love you, to love one another, to do the right thing, to manifest our faith in works. We can only do it when we abide in you. So, Lord, we just commit ourselves again to you. We surrender ourselves. We offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. And we pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of all of our sins, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We repent of all the selfishness, this we repent of our pride, Lord, and we, we pray that you would just, just empty us. We empty ourselves, Lord, and we, we just come to you with a clean and empty vessel, and we ask, Lord, that you would fill it anew with your Holy Spirit and that it would overflow and that we would just be sources of light and, and love in this world, Lord, and that, that we would just manifest it in practical ways. We ask for your help. We ask that you would change our hearts, Lord. We just commit all to you. We, we ask this of ourselves. We ask this of the whole church, Lord, that you would just cleanse and renew your church. It's so needed in these desperate times, Lord. We look out at a world that is sick and dying, and not only with this virus, but with the virus of sin. And Lord, we, we just ask that your light would shine forth. We ask for your mercy. Lord, we commit all into your hands, and we bless you and we praise you on this day. We ask now, Lord, that you hear us as we combine all of our prayers in the great prayer that you gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen. So now, my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. So go forth now into the world. Let your light shine before men. Manifest God's love to all people. And please, wear the mask. Wash your hands. Maintain that distance. Stay isolated if you're ordered to do so. Do the loving and the right thing. And God will bless you.